The first question that Heather asks is more of a question that deals with what uh, it's been dealt with for probably since time began. And uh, in theology, it's called the problem of theodicy. Uh, That is, why do bad things happen to good people? Why does this happen to me? Uh, Do I deserve this? Does this come from the enemy? And does it come from God? Uh, The best example that I can show to you of a man after God's heart that something like that happened to was Job. If you read the book of Job, You will see what happened to Job from the beginning, and then you will see what happened in the end, that things, uh, you know, happen for for the good. Um, Every situation is going to be different. Uh, I really do not believe that if you are a child of God, that God will allow the devil to overpower you. Do I need to repeat that? Okay. The Bible says that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And Paul said, I am persuaded that nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So, if you are in Christ, you are covered. And that insurance is better than prudential. You know, State Farm. (laughs) They'll give up when things are too high. But the insurance we have with God is a guaranteed insurance, no matter what. So, that doesn't mean that we still, we still have to deal with evil in the world. We still have to deal with, for example, why do people who don't smoke get cancer? We get, we get bad things that happen. Like, I got a ticket. Who, well, I, I told uh, my wife, I'm, I'm going to court to argue my case on this one. Uh, but even if I lost, if I lose the case, uh, it's not that, God wanted me to be punished, or that the devil got me, okay? It's uh, basically a lot of things that we do, they're because uh, we went against God's law, you know? Um, So, I don't know how many of you still smoke cigarette. Amen. Amen. It's time for you to stop. (laughs) <laughs> all right <laughs> all right <laughs> and uh i know some people drink and there's nothing wrong with drinking but if you drink to the point where you lose all your senses uh when you have liver problem later on don't blame god don't say why did god do this to me so, so the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that God deals with us based on his mercy and his grace. That's how God deals with us. But God does not excuse us when we go against his word without any conscience at all. You're going to suffer the consequences. If you go against his word, you're going to suffer the consequences. It doesn't mean you're going to be condemned, but you're going to be punished. So, uh, but to uh, address the uh, question that uh, Heather asked uh, directly, uh, sometimes we cannot, we cannot tell exactly why things happen to people. But we do know that you are, if you are in Christ, Paul said, Paul said that even if I have to go, for me to live is what? 
Christ and to die is what? Gain. So uh, death is really not the worst thing that's going to happen to people. You want me to, ask, to uh, repeat that again? Death is not the worst thing that will happen to people. If someone dies without Christ, that is the worst thing that's ever going to happen to them. Okay. The second question is about Joel Osteen, uh, message of inspiration. By the way, let me correct you. In my book, he's not a televangelist. Okay? Uh, because tel- a televangelist is someone who is preaching on TV, but he's preaching the word of God. And what is the word of God? The word of God is the gospel. And what is the gospel? The gospel is that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The gospel is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The gospel is, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The gospel is that Jesus came into the world to give his life for many. Okay, in John chapter 1 and verse 14, it said, The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld this glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is the gospel? Somebody is not preaching the gospel if they're not preaching about sin. And you're not preaching the gospel make everybody that's in the congregation feel okay. That's called transactional analysis. I'm okay and you're okay. And we're all okay. But one day you're going to find yourself in hell. (laughs) You know, so going out and telling everybody, of course, a lot of people love Joel Osteen. We know they love him because there are thousands and thousands and thousands in his congregation. If you want to test me out, you listen to him, listen to his message from the beginning to the end. He will never tell anybody they're sinners. So you cannot be a televangelist. The word evangelist comes from the Greek word uh, euangelion, which is the good news. So the preaching of the good news. And the preaching of the good news is telling people that Jesus can save them from their sins. Not telling them that they're good. Not telling them that they can be the better of themselves. Tomorrow and next day, whatever. Okay. Uh, what about the uh, Old Testament? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I, there's a second question that went with that. You said, can they get a sense of God, a, a sense of who God is from listening to someone like Joel Osteen? No, they cannot. It's impossible for you to get the sense of God from someone who preaches just one side of God. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, God is love, God is holy, God is just, God is righteous, God is the God of wrath. You know, on and on and on. When we talk about the attributes of God, you're talking about, you know, what God has revealed to us about himself. It's not what we discovered about him. What he has revealed to us about himself. So, he is a God of justice, he is a God of wrath. He's a God of righteousness. He's a God of holiness. He's a God of love. But you can't just preach his love. Yes. 
that you know it's a it's a good way to witness to people. So if someone tells you, you know, they listen to Joel Osteen and they like him, say, Hey, what do you like about him? And they will tell you what they like about him. And then you'll say, well, uh, can I show to you, that's a, that's one good side. But let me show you another side. And then you go into scripture and bring them, uh, uh, to a knowledge of Christ. You know, so it's a, it's a good opportunity to witness to people if you, you know. Okay. But can they get a sense of God? They cannot. Cannot get a sense of God through that. You know, a lot of us sometimes want to see God uh, as black or white. And he is not that. He's black, he's white, he's brown, he's yellow, he's green, he's everything. So you cannot just say one side of him, you know. So it's impossible for them to get a true knowledge of God. Number one, even if you have the Bible, there was a young preacher named uh, Charles Spurgeon who said, when you come to the science of God, we all become ignorant. Because the more you learn about God, if you want to look, uh, look at that quote in uh, uh, the book, uh, Knowing God, that was written by J.I. Parker. Uh, if you want to know the side of God, you have to understand that even reading the Bible, you know how, how much you read the Bible, you read the Bible over and over and over, and then one day you say, I have read this ten times, why didn't I see that? You know, it's, it's because there's so much to God that it's, it's impossible for us to really comprehend Him. You know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of man, and that light shines in darkness, and darkness has no what? overcome it. You know, that alone will keep you busy for 20 years. How many of you here truly understand the Trinity? How many of you accept it by faith? (laughs) All right. (laughs) So it is, it is important that, uh, we get this, that, of course, that's why we grow day by day. We grow every day because we know God a little bit more today than we did yesterday. That's why we do our devotions, right? Right? Okay. <laughs> because we want to get to know Him more and more and more and more every day. All right. What is the Old Testament Jubilee? And what symbol is it? Jubilee is a 50 year celebration. And the major thing in the Old Testament for the celebration of the Jubilee is that when the year of the Jubilee comes, everybody is to be forgiven their debt. So those of you that owe Visa and MasterCard, <laughs> just write them a note. <laughs> Instead of leaving money in there, just say the year of the Jubilee. Okay. <laughs> But, but that was the main thing. That was also the, uh, it wasn't just, uh, money or things like that. For example, if somebody did something against you, uh, this was the year, if you've been holding it against them, this was the year to let it go. 
you know, the year of the Jubilee was the year to just let it go. And uh, uh, I forgot your second question. Okay. What, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to Village Baptist Church? First, it means that we've been here for 50 years. <laughs> It also means that, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that happened this year that was sort of like a symbol, too. The county stole money from us, and we got it back. <laughs> uh, also, I, I, I'm hoping and praying that as a church, uh, if you have somebody in here that, uh, that you know has uh, done something against you, that you will uh, rectify it. You know, that's... I, I don't know what else, what other symbol to tie to it. You know. Does somebody have a symbol they think should go with the year of the Jubilee? Dr. Nimley, do you have a symbol that should go with that? No? Okay. Huh? The cross? Okay. Tell us what. Okay. Okay. The cross is a, it's a good symbol. Okay. What else? The what? Gold. gold. You guys gonna give me gold today? Thomas, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, Jehovah Witnesses. That's the next question. Uh, what do you say to them to stop coming to you? Let me give you the best advice. The best advice is know what you believe. When Jehovah Witnesses come to you, you should not be sending them away. They should be in a hurry to leave you. <laughs> but if they think they have someone that they can get things over, they will stay there forever. I have invited them to my house. And that's the last day they come by. I bring them and I say, sit down, sit down. Let's, you know, let's talk. <laughs> because you don't know who you're going to affect by the gospel. Because Jehovah's Witnesses don't have the gospel. They do, not, they do not have the gospel. If someone can tell you that Jesus is not God, that destroys everything about Christianity. Everything about Christianity. If someone can tell you that the Holy Spirit is the mighty force of God, salvation is not possible. And by the way, if only 144,000 is going to be saved, <laughs> uh, even Jehovah Witnesses have more than that. So I don't know why people stand in the street corners selling books when they know they ain't going anywhere. So that is my best advice. My best advice is I know that I have preached several times on what Jehovah Witnesses believe. Uh, if you want my notes, I can give you my notes. Uh, if you want to study it, uh, there's also there's also a website. Uh, what's what's the website for Christian Research Institute? CRI.org. CRI.org. They will help you. 
you know, you can go to that website and get what you can on that. So it's really important that you understand this. If you don't know what you believe, then you don't want to invite them in and you don't want to talk to them because we don't want you to be converted. <laughs> okay. Because they are trained. Amen? Amen. They are well trained. Uh, you know, in our church, when I'm giving classes, I have a hard time getting uh, 10% of the church to attend. Amen. <laughs> you know, it's really important uh, when we're being trained, if you're really interested in the things of God, this is where you need to be so you can be taught the word of God. Uh, again, um, uh, Sister Heather, I'm going to give you some scripture verses to help you out. Okay, so you can you can read them. Um, I think that's about it. To actually let go, because that's the place where the rehearsal is taking place. Now, what happens in rehearsal tends to get acted out on the main stage. That's what Jesus is saying. That's why you need to guard your heart. So if you wrestled with the whole thing of forgiveness in your heart, if you wrestled with the whole thing of, uh, you know, so this week, um, when, I, when I meet with guys that I'm accountable to, the, the thing I know I need to be honest about that I've wrestled with this week is fear. I've got a difficult phone call to make tomorrow. I had a difficult conversation with, with someone who served me really well, who gave me information that I didn't want to hear yesterday. And as a result of that, all these thoughts come into my mind of, oh, what, what are they going to think? What happens if that doesn't happen? Pressure, stress, anxiety. Now at that point, it's review your plans for living, going back to last week, review your plans for living in the next five minutes. Chris, do you want to be shaped by stress and fear and the circumstances that, that loom over you as your potential teacher? Or do you want Jesus to be your teacher? Review your plans for living and in light of the fact that the kingdom of heaven is very close. Oh, quick, Jesus, where are you? Now, I, I've got to find that piece of, in my heart if I'm to then allow it to reach the rest of, of the play that is Chris Vincent. Does that make sense? Now, I think Jesus um, is very clear about um, how you do that um, in, in other other elements of his life, the way he demonstrates things. I think it's attention to two things. Uh, and then you notice I've, I've put down the whole thing of um, sometimes as Christians we just try harder. I've got to be more at peace. Try, try. I've got to worry less. Try. I mustn't worry about what he said, he thinks, or what she thinks. Uh, my experience of trying harder is that I just add to the stress and the anxiety. But Jesus um, makes it very clear that we need to work with the Spirit of God but we need to invest ourselves so it's, it's, not, it's not works that gain us forgiveness and, and help us, uh, that, that by its own merit moves us on but we reciprocate with the grace of God the grace of God is available we do whatever we can to reach out and have hands that can catch it and those activities are called spiritual disciplines so if if my issue is my heart is full of anxiety and stress, I've got to engage in a spiritual discipline that can catch the grace of God that would want to bring the peace of heaven to me. Now, I, I know exactly what that is for me. I think that, that spiritual disciplines need to reflect our unique mix. So for me, um, fear, the very nature of fear that brings stress and anxiety and robs me of peace, the very notion of fear comes from the one who came up with the idea in the first place. His name is Satan. He's a liar. That's his nature. He's the father of lies. To the extent that he will, he will seek to kill us, literally kill us, if he can. And that's not overplaying it. Yeah? So, what he will seek to do is shut us down so that we are not aware of the choice that we have in the kingdom. That's what fear does. My experience is that when I'm fearful, I, I hide within myself. 
I feel if I now talk to this person or that person, they're going to think I'm an idiot, that'll add to my stress, so I'm certainly not going to do that. But actually, if the kingdom says no, what you've got to do is you've got to expose what's going on inside so that the kingdom can come and shine light on it. And what is true, and is a real issue, God will come and strengthen you and put courage and faith in you, because that's the dynamic of the kingdom, it's the culture. And what isn't true, you'll see that, it'll fall away, and you'll go, I'm not having that anymore, it's a lie. You see? So, the spiritual discipline for me, when, I am, when I've lost my peace and when I'm stressed, is I've got to talk out to God or to someone that I trust, Rachel or my triplet or whoever's deciding, I've got to confess that. Because the words break the control that is trying to hold me back and hide me down. See, our culture has taught us men don't cry. Men don't share their burdens. They're tough. They push through it. Well, actually, uh, that's not biblical. That's not of the culture of the kingdom. It's true for women as well. Women can be just as bad as men. Um, And the issue is, what we need to do is, the emotion is telling us, oh, something's wrong. Emotions are godly gifts. They're not wrong. But they're not meant to shape our lives. They're, They're communication devices to help us figure out what's going on in our world. So if I'm feeling stressed, I don't shut down. I go, oh, I'm stressed. Well, I've got to listen. Why am I feeling stressed? What is it that's happening? Okay, I've got to take that to God. But for me, my problem is I'm too thick or I'm too busy to realise what I'm feeling. I mean, I'm in the fast lane all the time, so I've got to stop long enough to the spiritual discipline when I'm stressed is I've got to have some solitude. Not to put the telly on or read a book, but solitude so that I can go heart, it's rehearsal time. Let's just act this one out. Why are you like this? What's going on? Now, who do you want to shape you in that fearful place? So, with this phone call that I've got to make, and with, with the conversation that I had, it was like, a lot of it was just lies. It was lie, lie, lie. I, oh, hang on a minute, I'm feeling all this. Oh, there's no way I'm going to pick the phone. Oh, there's no way I'm going to get it. Oh, and I, I got a bit grumpy, and, it, and I, I, I said to the person who I was meeting, oh, poor can I tell you what, what's going on? You might have thought I'm a bit distant there, but actually what's gripping me is fear. Oh. But is anything like this, or am I just weird? I'm, oh, oh, yes, fear. Oh. Okay, and I recognise that now. The way I was trained and taught by culture was shut down on it, get moody, stay grumpy for a week, try and just work harder, Kingdom teaches me no. Confess your sins. He's faithful, he's just, he comes, and he'll, he'll cleanse it as long as you engage in the kingdom. So my experience is, as, as I just talk it out from that solitude, I, I, think, I, I don't do that very well. I have to journal. I can't even figure out what's been going on. So I write it down. Spiritual discipline, journal. It's called, it's called confession of writing, by writing. Yeah. And I find that men sometimes find that very helpful because they, they, um, they haven't learned how to, to speak. <laughs> okay. um, and in that way. Okay. So the spiritual discipline of solitude gives me this... At, at the point where I'm going solitude, I'm, I'm trying to come up with anything that I can fill my time with rather than journaling. Okay. Some of that is the flesh, some of that is the enemy. But I've got to die to that. Chocolate cupcake. Oh, which do I want? Oh, I'm going to silence the desire to switch my computer on this morning because I need to get with God. And at the point where I then go, oh yeah, it was that phone call. I, I know I've got to make, oh, I'm fearful about that. I go, right, I need to see you, God. I can't see you until I get rid of all the rubbish that is feeding inside me. Splurred, splurred, it's like this God, he said this, she said that, that's how I, it made me feel good. And, and then, then I begin to feel things. And, and that's where I, 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 I go, ah, this is horrible. Ah, speaking out spirit. And tongues are incredibly helpful. How dare you make me feel like that? I'm a ch-. And then I, 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 I begin to find some truth. Now, that, that, that might take 15 minutes, that might take half an hour. I may get stuck. And then I might have to worship God for a bit, and then I... Um, and I found that the more I've done it, is it fair to say this, darling, the more... When I met Rachel, um, I was a mess in this whole department of life. Rachel was shaped in a very different way 
uh, by God and by her parents and the way I was shaped. I was a mess. I didn't understand how the kingdom wanted to come and break in in these ways. Whereas my issue now is I'm, I'm quite quick to realise what's going on. I still struggle to die to my own agenda sometimes. I like nursing the hurt or the fear. It brings attention to me. That means my family don't tolerate it for the moment. <laughs> Tell me what I need to go and do. But it's that sense of we now need to find appropriate spiritual disciplines that bring us back into the kingdom where other things have taken us away. And I've put down some suggestions and examples of things that I've found. Um, you know, one of them is tiredness. Um, sometimes I'm, I get up in the morning and I'm grumpy. And when I process why am I like that, it's because I, I went to bed late. Spiritual discipline, go to bed early. Uh, sometimes I feel quite shut down and I feel distant from people. And nearly always that's because I need to process some hurt or pain something that I haven't allowed to get to its end point as God designed it and I need to now make my choice. Die to self or you know, chocolate cupcake or bring it I want the chocolate cupcake. But that's, I don't like expressing emotion. It's painful. It's, it takes time. It's, well, you've got a choice, Chris. Kingdom's very close at hand. Um, and I think normally, if it's a sin of omission, I, I failed to do something the spiritual discipline normally needs to be a spiritual discipline of engagement. So if I haven't expressed my fear, that's a sin of omission, I need to do some confession, either by journaling or by talking. Um, if I if I acted a, a sin of, um, of commission, of, I've engaged with something that I shouldn't have done, normally the spiritual discipline is a detaching spiritual discipline. So, I'm stressed because I've, I've been sinful. God, I've worked too hard this week. I haven't built boundaries around my life. I haven't given myself space to be with you. And I'm frazzled. And everyone knows it. Okay? You need a spiritual discipline of solitude that detaches you, takes you out. And in that sense, our... our our objective, Jesus' objective, is to teach us to have a well-ordered heart. And my experience is that, that brings wonderful security. It, it means that you can, you can stand when circumstances buffet you, because actually you're not responding from circumstances quite so much. You're responding from internals that don't change. Jesus is the same today as he was yesterday. And I'm, I'm rooted in those, I'm operating out of my heart. That, and then, then I'll have a bad day when it just goes to pot and I'm going, what a, why on earth did we move to Ireland? Oh, God. I had a bad conversation there and this didn't happen as I thought, oh. And what's happened? In my heart, I've looked at my circumstances rather than Jesus. I need to. Does that make sense? Um, what are your top three barriers at the moment? Just ask that. What, what's stopping you from loving God and loving other people at the moment? Just answer that for yourself. And then think, right, what, what do I need to be doing in the next seven days that will be the equivalent of me holding out my hands to grab grace from God? You may want to write those things down. You may want to. I'm less spontaneous, more organised in some things. And so I find it helpful to work with diaries. So I go, right, I need solitude time. So when's that going to happen this week? 
I don't get it in my diary, I know it won't happen. Some others find that with death, I need need to be more spontaneous. Again, your your unique mix needs to be reflected in your spiritual discipline. So, for some of you, it's really great. I I was asking Steve some of these things. And it's just interesting that, you know, he he hasn't done much journaling, but actually, to get his guitar and worship, it's just felt like, oh, that for you, Steve, is how you process. Just to worship. And as he worships, I'm sure, out comes some of the gunk, and then he might do some stuff, and you you wouldn't want to see me play the guitar. God certainly wouldn't, and and it wouldn't ever find me or God, so I I, I need to find other ways of doing it. Um, But it's important that that we engage with those things. Let's pray, shall we? opportunity to respond to Jesus if you feel like uh, you just want to be like Peter Peter's great isn't he he helps me realise I qualify when I fluff it I qualify when I get it right I like him when he gets it wrong oh Jesus love and patience but you know, who do you say Jesus is this year? Settle You want to be a disciple of Jesus. Jesus, where um okay, I'm thinking something, right? I feel like as I as we've looked at this passage, I feel like this is open some stuff up. And I don't want to, I don't want to belittle that. But at the same time, I don't want to shy away from the fact that this is God's agenda. So in other words, I want to be sensitive to it. So if that's you this evening, you know it's still hot. And Jesus, I pray for grace to bring faith. Above the pain of the confusion. Jesus, I want to thank you that you are a great high priest who's gone before us. You understand what it's like to be human. But I also want to thank you, Jesus, that you declared it's done, it's finished, everything has been provided for. Father, I want to ask for some miracles here today. I want to pray that you put in hearts uh, some seeds that weren't there before tonight. I pray that you water and blow on them, Jesus, and I ask you that they would grow into oaks of righteousness for the display of the Lord's splendour. I pray that you would now spring some of those prison doors in our lives. We know that the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on us for that. Isaiah 61. And again, this is not just for us, this is for our families, this is for our loved ones, this is for those who, who don't even yet know Jesus, this is for people in our street, this is for Ireland. And we, we ask you this evening, Jesus, we intercede for ourselves. Now, strengthen us, God, equip us, help us. Help us, Jesus. But we we pray with faith. Would you put something in us as a church, as a family that becomes literally like a blazing lamp that burns. Mm. Like a vibrant city on a hill that draws everyone's attention. Not for our glory, God, but for your renown and reputation. Mm. And I pray that it, some of it would come in, in these areas of seeing people set free 
Jesus. Jesus. And we, we just want to look at you, Jesus, because when we look at ourselves, we, we struggle to believe that it can happen. But when we look at you, oh God, I want to thank you that nothing that's been on earth this evening surprises you. Nothing of it worries you. We're done. I think what would be crazy if someone could put the kettle on, people want to grab a drink. If, you, if you're sitting there and you're feeling like, oh, well, let's stir the pot and you want to talk before you go home, and that's possible, that's fine. Um, really fine. If you want to chat with someone, grab them, make sure that that happens. Okay? Um, Are you? He said, no, I need to find the head so I can kick him in the behind. <laughs> we want to kick people in the behind when they do us wrong. We want to get even. That's kind of our nature, our natural way. But Jesus says, forgive. Be willing to forgive. Even if people don't come to us, and most don't who hurt us, they don't come and, and ask us to forgive them. But we forgive them anyway, Jesus says. All the people who put Jesus on the cross, they didn't apologize. But he forgave them anyway. When we forgive, it's not being soft-hearted foolish. It's not being a doormat. It's showing strength. Showing strength. Because it takes power and strength to be willing to forgive someone who has wronged us. Sometimes we have resentment and hard feelings, and we try to cover it up, from the pharmacy or on the street or from losing sleep or being upset with somebody usually who love us the most. We take it out trying to cover that up. So Jesus said, delete it. Get it out of your mind. Give it out of your heart. Because unforgiveness is a sin that creeps in. Often when we don't even realize it. And it's more dangerous than many other sins. Unforgiveness may not cause overdoses or automobile accidents, but if it's unchecked, someone said it's like a cancer, it will eat us alive. So forgive, Jesus said. We return hate for hate, and it multiplies hate. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. And the light comes from Jesus Christ. We have to trust God to understand his forgiveness. I saw a bumper sticker one day. It said, when you make a mess, confess. When you make a mess, confess. And Jesus forgives. And he wants us to do the same. Small country church, the preacher was preaching on forgiveness. And he said, I want you to confess something. How many of you have been able to forgive your enemies? A small congregation, but they all raised their hand, except 93-year-old Miss Jenny sitting on the front row. He said, Miss Jenny, you haven't forgiven your enemies? She says, he says, why? She said, I don't have any. She said, I outlived those witches. <laughs> you see, the man in the parable needed God's forgiveness. But he didn't want to forgive anybody else. 
That's what we've got to grasp onto. As much like Jesus as we can be to care for others. So let's don't carry around this stuff, this garbage that keeps us from being all that God, through Christ, would want us to be. Let's delete it. Don't keep saying, oh, if I had done this, if you've wronged somebody, don't keep saying, oh, if I had just done this or done that. If you need to apologize, go do it. Go do it. Don't let it rob you of your sleep. Don't let it keep you from being who you should be. Yes, we should be accountable. But we don't need to keep living it over and over again. So as I close, let me remind you. Don't deny forgiveness to someone else. And remember how much forgiveness it takes for Jesus Christ to forgive our sins. Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Go, go, and sin no more. He forgives you. Delete it. Thanks be to God.